again, elasticity is what we've been focusing on so far. We haven't been thinking about how things deform in time. Uh, viscoelasticity is everything. All the types of problems that take uh, time-dependent deformation to an, into account. And entity is, is a special subset where when I deform a material, it'll, it'll deform in some elastic way, then it'll creep or relax. And then when I let go of the load, it'll recover back to its original shape. Um, just as a couple general definitions here. So for stuff, we're only going to be focusing on 1D materials. So we're going to ignore all of, our, all of the 3D deformations that we've been looking at before, 2D deformations. And, I, and I'm just going to be looking at now, uh, in general, a bar with some stress and some strain. And now I want to know how does stress relate to strain with time. So there's now a couple, let's see. I'm going to draw a couple figures now. Um, so I want us to kind of play a thought experiment for a minute. So if I if I take this rod, this one-dimensional rod, and I apply a stress, a step function stress, so I instantaneously apply some sigma in space in time, uh, and I hold it, and then I go to zero. So I'm applying some sigma naught at some instant t in time, or t1 in time. Um, I can then say from my elasticity relationships, the only thing I would predict is that, that I have a corresponding strain that goes up and drops away with time. So I hit some epsilon naught, and this is my elastic behavior. So the second I apply that step load in stress, my strain also instantaneously extends. Um, and then as I, if I hold the material there, it stays at that same strain. And then the second I let go, it drops back down to zero. So that's elastic, and that was our that was our relationship. Um, sigma equals e epsilon. So this was our our one D Hooke's law relationship for just a bar in uniaxial strain. But really, that's not likely what's going to happen. So in most real materials, um, what actually takes place is something more like this. So uh, I have some epsilon naught some epsilon 1 at that time step t in time, I'll get some, if I applied theoretically, well, even though technically this is impossible, I can't apply an instantaneous load, but this is our thought experiment. If I apply that instantaneous load, I would get an instantaneous strain response, and then my material would kind of keep deforming over time, um, eventually plateauing. Uh, at what my at some epsilon naught, um, and then when I release that load, it would drop back down by some amount, and then it would continue to relax down with time, where this drop would. Well, we're also going to say that'll be an epsilon one. So this type of response, specifically, this is this is a phenomenon known as creep. So, if I apply some stress. If I apply some stress here, some instantaneous stress, my strain will kind of jump up a little bit, but then over time it'll kind of keep extending. So um, I brought now, don't run away from me, some toys. Okay, so this is silly putty, um, or thinking putty. I don't know what thinking putty is, but I guess it's a, another very serious silly putty. It's for, for thinking for ME 354 lectures. Um, so here with the silly putty, if I apply a stress, if I apply a stress, there's some instantaneous deformation. But then if I'm holding that stress constant, it just kind of keeps going in time. So if I, if I keep holding that stress, it just keeps creeping out like this. This is a particularly exaggerated example. Um, most materials do not do this. but there's still that to some degree. So even, even something like a ceramic or a metal will have some amount of creep, and that creep will change depending on exactly 
how much load I'm applying. So um, that's one phenomena that's interesting. Uh, so this this now is a is a viscoelastic behavior. Viscoelastic, um, and I don't know for this how my stress relates to my strain, but this is kind of what we'll be defining today. We'll we'll come up with a couple models, or we'll define a couple simple models, which are how people started thinking about these sorts of things. Um, conversely, if I applied an instantaneous strain to my material, so some strain, some time t, if I apply an instantaneous a step load and strain to some epsilon naught, my stress, oh, not strain, oh. My stress two, 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 um, would probably jump up to some stress load, some sigma naught, and then if I held it at the same displacement, it would actually start to relax. So that stress would start to drop until I let go of the strain, and then if I, I would actually be pulling it back down a little bit, and it would kind of creep back up to normal. So this phenomena is known as relaxation. Relaxation. I can spell things. So this one similarly, if I, if I take our, our thinky putty, thinking putty, uh, and I apply some strain out, the amount, I guess I can't really illustrate this as well, but to hold it here, I, I'm applying less and less force, and it's actually relaxed. You can actually see um, out of plane now, it's, it's starting to creep down, so it's starting to droop. Um, because again, this is a particularly exaggerated example of that. Um, so this is this is this is creep. If I hold a constant stress and it stretches out, and it's relaxation. If I apply a constant strain and then the stress internally starts reducing, which is a little bit harder to illustrate. Um, for these pro for these materials now, there's a time dependence in their behavior. So silly putty, if I apply a low force gradually, it'll extend. But if I apply a high force, I can actually get it to break. So let's see. Um, so if I apply a very high strain rate, I'm I'm pushing my stress so high so fast that it's hitting the yield strength of the material. Whereas if I <coughs> apply a low stress, it's it's able to just kind of creep into form. So now not only is there some shape change with time, but my mechanical properties can change over time as well. So depending on, on how fast I'm applying these strain rates. So how do we actually go about modeling these things? This paper. Uh, cool. Do this. Uh, all right. So we're going to create what's called a uh, mechanical analogy. So mechanical So this is the way that people have kind of started thinking about this these sorts of problems, these sort of viscoelastic problems, and this is actually how they continue to use the to use them today. So for that, I grab my Dash pot. Uh, too many papers. Too many things. Okay, so there's two tools that we'll play with now in our mechanical analogy. The first is a spring, do, 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 which we'll represent as this. Um, for a spring, this will be our kind of traditional elastic model. I'll say that if I apply some stress, there's some corresponding e epsilon. So this is our our spring analogy. Um, this also means that uh, if I have some strain rate, so um, I'm going to be using dot notation here, but d sigma dt, which is equal to sigma dot, uh, is equal to e epsilon dot. So um, if I apply different strain rates, there's a stress rate, but these relate to each other linearly. Um, and my other tool 
is going to be a dash pot, which is basically a, a slider. So this is a dash pot, um, and this I'll say relates to my strain sigma equals uh, eta epsilon dot. So now my the my strain rate relates to the applied stress, and so what that means is basically. Uh, um, so this is this is effectively a slider. So I have a a slider here. Um, if I apply some force sigma, then I get some low strain rate. If I apply a higher force, then I get a higher strain rate. And so that that strain rate, you can imagine this is um, pretend there's no back half of the ruler here, uh, but this my my thing would be extending. Uh, and so my strain is increasing, but it's increasing at a certain rate with a constant stress. So this is what our dash pot is, is, is mechanically representing. It's a, it's a slider. Um, so our spring now, by, uh, if I look at a certain stress, so if I apply some stress sigma, Then my strain, uh, sigma, sigma naught, epsilon, epsilon naught. Then I get some corresponding strain in time for my dash pot. If I apply some stress, sigma naught, then my strain is increasing at time, increasing in time. And this amount of increase now scales with some eta. Um, as a frame of reference, oh, let's get this thing to focus. Uh, as a frame of reference, I'm going to give you a couple different material properties. Which, uh, there. Um, so that eta now is, is a viscosity. So eta is our parameter for viscosity. And that viscosity changes depending on our materials. So um, if I have different materials, now uh, my viscosity, so my stress is in units of uh, Pascals, my strain rate is in units of inverse time. So um, epsilon dot is uh, units of inverse time. So my viscosity now, my eta, is in units of Pascal seconds. So, or MBA seconds or kilopascal seconds, uh, depending on exactly what the viscosity of the material is, kind of shift that around. Um, but for something like water, water has a viscosity of, of 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. Um, something like oil, this would be like cooking oil, vegetable oil. Um, so, cooking oil is something like. 3 times 10 to the minus 2, um, something like honey is 5, where'd you go, 5.5, 5 5.5, 5 .5. <laughs> something like creamy peanut butter, you know, notice I'm using foods and things that you can eat because those are probably things you're more familiar with in terms of viscosity, um, creamy peanut butter is something around 30. Our silly putty, our silly putty, is now something on the order of eight <coughs> times ten to the four. So this has a relatively high viscosity, um, and so if I oh relatively high, um, so if I deform it, it, it that deformation rate, that viscosity rate. Um, is going to be something on the, on the order of that. There's actually, um, so even sometimes materials you don't necessarily think of as viscous are, 
so there was a really interesting experiment um, done by a professor in Australia that was started in the 1920s, actually, which some of you look like you might be familiar with this, uh, known as the pitch drop experiment. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, so um, pitch. So the pitch drop experiment, this is what I have. Yeah, pitch is tar. So the, the stuff they hold roads together with. So this is the pitch drop experiment. So uh, set up in the 1920s, uh, this guy put pitch or tar in a funnel and just kind of let it go. So even though it looks like it's something that's, that's a solid material and again, it's holding roads together, it actually creeps over time. But the amount, the viscosity is so, so, so high, it's hard to, to get an experimental measure of. Um, so there, they t touched down and they took away the beaker. But you can see now it just kind of keeps going and keeps dripping down. And so this is an incredibly viscous material. Um, but they actually, I think this is the, the world's longest continuously running experiment. And one drop of this falls every 10 years. Apparently they put in air conditioning after a few years and that screwed everything up. And it went from every like eight or nine years to every 12 to 13 years because the temperature, it's temperature dependent, of course. Um, so pitch, it turns out, has a viscosity on the order of two times 10 to the eighth. So many, 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 about, a, what was it, like two or three billion um, orders, two or three billion orders of magnitude higher than water, more viscous than water. So everything around us has some viscosity. It's just whether that viscosity is physically realizable. I think technically, if you did this with a metal, if you put a hunk of aluminum or steel in a jar and let it drip like that, you would theoretically get drops of steel and aluminum similar to the to the pitch, but it would just happen on a time scale much longer than any of us would be alive for. Um, I mean, even this every ten to drop every ten years is pretty cool. Um, okay, so now there's a couple a couple things I'm gonna or so now we're gonna take these two tools, our spring and our dash pot, and we're gonna combine them in different ways to try to figure out how different materials respond to, to strain rates. So um, for there's two ways that I'm going to combine these things. The first is in parallel. So here I'm just drawing a box representing an element. So box one, box two, um, and I'm going to get some strain total and stress total out. I know that, so now this is, uh, this is sort of analogous to circuits. For those of you who have taken a circuits class, um, a little bit, so we, we have some rate dependence of these. Um, but when we, when we add these units up in parallel, we can say that the stress total is equal to the stress in one plus the stress in two and the strain total is equal to the strain in one, and it's also equal to the strain in the second. So the, the strain for units in parallel is equal. The stress total, the, the, the total stress that I'm applying here at the end, uh, is equal to the sum of the stresses in the two parts. Uh, the other way I can combine things is in series. So if I have things in parallel, the next logical step is in series. So if I have two units, block one and block two, uh, and I'm looking for some epsilon total and stress total, I can say my stress total uh, is the stress in one and it's equal to the stress in two, and my epsilon total is equal to the sum of these two, epsilon one plus epsilon two. So here, basically, I'm going to take different combinations of springs and dash pots, and I'm going to pop them in to uh, either in, in series or in parallel or in some combination of that to see if I can create a me mechanical analogy to, to predict some sort of some sort of time dependent behavior. So the first model for this, so this again was started a long time ago, um, but uh, the first 
one of these models that we'll look at is the Maxwell model. Maxwell model. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to take a spring and a dash pot in series. So this is kind of logically one of the simplest ways that I can do this. So I have a spring and a dash pot here. Spring has some constant e, dash pot has some constant eta, um, and I'm looking for the stress and strain. So now for that dash pot, <coughs> I know, again, the strain total is equal to epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, and I know for a spring, uh, sigma is equal to e epsilon, and for a dash pot, sigma is equal to eta epsilon dot. So there's a problem there. So I, I have I have how the stress relates to a strain rate. I know my stress total is equal to stress in one to the stress two, which I'm just going to call some stress. Um, so the stress at the end here. But I, I don't know how to combine this, my other stress, just based on this equation alone. So what I can do is I can take this guy and take a rate derivative. Epsilon total is equal to epsilon 1 dot plus epsilon 2 dot, because these are all separate. Um, when I take a time derivative, um, these stay separate. Now I can say my um, here epsilon dot is sigma dot over e for this guy, and for this one, epsilon dot is stress over eta. So now my strain total rate is stress over e plus that over eta. So now I have some relationship between the strain rate and the stress and the stress rate. But I want to try to figure out kind of how this responds in time. So a Maxwell model, when I have a spring and a dash pot, what this is basically going to do, uh, here we go. So you remember our spring responds linearly in time and our dash pot responds with the time derivative. So what this is going to do physically is when I apply a certain strain, when I, or when I apply a certain stress to this thing, um, in terms of strain, I'm going to get a jump up and then it's going to be a kind of a continuous increase because I have a constant strain applied. Um, so I'm not <laughs> sigma naught. And I'm going to get that constant increase until I release the load. And then this will drop back down and kind of stay flat afterward. So technically this is this is a viscoelastic and not an anelastic material because it predicts a permanent deformation. And so this is kind of, if I had, um, oh, I wonder if I can do this. No, this is probably not going to work out. But um, this is kind of like if I if I took my slider, I applied some force to the end, it would slide over time, and then the second I release it, it would still be permanently deformed by that amount. Um, so now what I want to do, that's my notes, um, is I want to figure out how how this relates in time. How this how this deforms in time, so I'm going to simplify this first. I'm going to say, take a scenario where um, I have some applied, some in, in, initial <coughs> initial epsilon um, is equal to zero, or some epsilon equals epsilon naught, and I'm not applying a strain to my material. Or I'm not I'm not increasing that strain to my material, so I this is applying constant um, strain. 
So now what I'm, what I'm basically going to be looking at here is, is how this material, or how this material model creeps over time, or sorry, relaxes, how this material model relaxes over time. So if I apply a strain and I kind of leave it sitting there at that strain, how does it respond? So I can plug this in now, um, and I can say solving this thing out, zero is equal to, uh, I'm going to, yeah, let's start like this, E plus sigma over eta. Um, I'm going to now represent this as a dt, so um, d sigma dt plus uh, I'm going to multiply both sides by e over eta sigma is equal to zero. I want to move things around now, so I can integrate this. This is a differential equation, um, so I can solve. I can try to solve this differential equation. Um, I can say this turns into a uh, d sigma. Where do I want to write things? Mm. Let's continue up here. Um, d sigma dt is equal to negative e over eta sigma. So d sigma over sigma is equal to minus e over eta dt. I can integrate that over some time from zero to sigma. Um, then I can say this now is a natural log. This is minus e t over eta. So my sigma, uh, what am I missing? Plus a c, plus some constant. Um, c1, if I take an exponent for both sides, this then becomes some new c, uh, e to the minus e t over eta. I know at my initial time, so at time zero, um, so if sigma at time is equal to zero, um, should be my e epsilon naught, because that's how much it jumps up initially. So I know when I plug in t is equal to zero here, this term goes away. I can then say my c is equal to e epsilon. Um, so this is actually sigma is equal to e epsilon naught e to the minus e t over eta. So uh, now I have how this is going to respond in time. So I have this exponential relationship, um, sigma equals e epsilon uh, minus et over eta. So what this basically means is now my scenario, oh, the scenario that I was trying to solve is I'm applying epsilon naught at some time t some epsilon naught at some time t. Let's see if I can do this with two papers. This is always tricky. Um, and now, uh, over time, that stress is going to go up to some stress naught, which is e epsilon naught at that instant in time going to jump up, and then it's going to exponentially decay down with time, based on this e to the minus e eta t, or e t over eta. Um, so now this is sigma equals e epsilon naught e to the minus e t over eta. There we go. So I can move this out of the way. Okay, 
So this now, um, I can define a constant tau uh, equal to um, E over eta is my relaxation time. So this is units of time. Um, and this is, uh, oh, flip that, sorry, eta over E. E is my relaxation time, uh, and so this is kind of the basically the half life of of my stress, how long it takes me to decay. So I can rewrite this as a sigma equals e epsilon naught e to the minus t over tau. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so now my my tau is that relaxation time for my material. Okay. So I can solve this again now. So this is, this is now a nice model for relaxation. Um, I can solve this again now for the slightly more complicated case of applying a constant strain rate. So um, this now, I can, I can try to see how this thing responds if I am giving it some epsilon naught in time. Uh, do I want to do that? Maybe not. Maybe I'll show that tomorrow. Um, let's look at the Voigt model first, or Kelvin Voigt. OK. So uh, the other simple model, the other simple representation model, is what's known as the Kelvin Voigt model. Kelvin Voigt. So, uh, this model, for the Maxwell model, we've had them in series. The next logical thing to try is putting them in parallel. So, now I'm going to have a spring on one side, a dash pot on the other side. And I want to figure out, again, what the stress and strain are. This has some E. This has some eta. Um, so here now I know if I have that stress, stress total for this sum is equal to the stress in 1 plus the stress in 2, epsilon is equal these strains are equal, um, is equal to epsilon 1, is equal to epsilon 2. My stress now, I can kind of plug in a little bit more simply. Um, so I know my stress total is E epsilon, and my uh, stress 2 is a plus eta epsilon dot, where now my total strain is just some epsilon here. Um, and I want to solve this now for the scenario where I have a constant stress applied. So now my stress is equal to that. So I want to try to solve the case where apply I apply a constant stress sigma naught. So here now, solving this guy, I have sigma naught is equal to E epsilon plus eta d epsilon dt. I can move some stuff around um, and I can say d epsilon dt is equal to e epsilon sigma minus e epsilon over eta. Um, I can take this now. Uh, You can 
steal paper when she came in. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you. Um. Okay. Let's keep working on this. There we go. That works. Okay. Uh. So now I can take this reorganize things here. Say d epsilon over sigma minus e epsilon is equal to dt over eta. This is a little bit of a weird one. So taking it from zero to epsilon, zero to epsilon, sorry, sigma naught, sigma naught. Um, this is a slightly weird integral, but some of you may still recognize it. Um, if I take this, this is actually the natural log of sigma naught minus e epsilon, but if I took a derivative of that, the e negative e would come out, so I have to divide by 1 over e. This is equal to t over eta, and this I'm going to take from 0 to epsilon, and from, oh, I'm going to put an epsilon there. From 0 to t. There we go. From 0 to t, but when t is 0, then this thing is 0, so this is still just t epsilon. Here now I actually need to take into account this 0 term. So this, I'm going to move this e epsilon over to the other side. Uh, I'm going to say a natural log of sigma naught minus e epsilon from 0 to epsilon is equal to minus e t over eta. Um, this now is the natural log of sigma naught minus e epsilon minus the natural log of sigma naught, which I can also bring in natural log of sigma naught minus e epsilon over sigma naught is equal to minus e t over eta. Um, solving this, I can say now uh, sigma minus e epsilon is equal to, sorry, sigma naught, uh, e to the minus e t over eta. Um, and solving now for epsilon, I can say epsilon is equal to sigma naught over e times 1 minus e to the minus e t over eta, or some epsilon naught, 1 minus e to the minus e t over eta. So what happens now, if I apply a constant stress to this, If I apply some stress, uh, let's make this flatter. I don't know if that actually made it better. Um, stress, sigma naught. What I'm going to get. Uh, is some um, creep behavior. What this is going to exponentially approach my epsilon naught over time. So this now is our creep. If I then release that load um, I could do similar analysis for um, stress for zero applied stress with with some epsilon at time zero equals epsilon naught, um, and I would get something like uh, epsilon is equal to epsilon naught e to the minus e t over eta. Um, 
if I if I went through again that same sort of analysis. So here now the second the second I release this load, I would actually get now again a negative a similar sort of exponential decay. So this is now a nice simple model for capturing that creep behavior. Um, Yeah. So uh, the next step in this is actually combining these together. So creating kind of a, a hodgepodge of this Maxwell and this uh, Kelvin Voigt model. But I don't know if I have time to go through it in very much detail, and I'm just going to get interrupted halfway. So maybe that's a good point to stop. Um, are there any questions on this so far? Yeah. So the derivation itself wouldn't, but knowing this general form of the equation would be. Just knowing that there's some exponential decay. Um, and again, here I, I can define a tau as equal to minus eta over e, or eta over e. And so there's some there's some relaxation time, and in general these follow exponential decay relationships, so that at least the f know the final equation for them. But yeah, I want to make sure to at least show where they all come from instead of just being like, here's an equation, know the equation. Other questions on things. Okay. I will see you all on Friday then.